Oklahoma City University. And we have seventh and eighth graders from uh, Cassidy School here in Oklahoma City, in addition to our regular visitors. So welcome to all of you, and um, you are in for a real treat today. And Charlie Hanger, since we started our summer series, Charlie has always been the speaker who um, brings it all together for us at the end of the summer. And um, he has a, a quite remarkable story. Um, and one of the things, one of the many lessons that are important to learn and that, that he will remind you all about it, uh, is that on April 19, 1995, Charlie Hanger was doing his job responsibly, following all the rules, all the procedures that he needed to follow, just like he did every day on the job. But it was amazingly more important that day than probably any other day he did that. So part of the lesson of his story is to remind us that we never know um, who we might be impacting in our, in our daily lives, and it's always important to be doing the right thing and doing it well. On April 19, 1995, Charlie made a routine traffic stop that ended with the arrest of Timothy McVeigh, who was later convicted and executed for the bombing of the Alfred, Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building. He began his 30-year career with the Oklahoma Highway Patrol as a dispatcher in 1972 and served in a variety of roles, including field supervisor to Troop K, supervisor for the Special Operations Troop assigned to the Criminal Interdiction Unit. In January 2005, he began a new law enforcement career as the sheriff of Noble County. When you came in, you found on your chair a comment card and a pen. We would appreciate it when the program ends if you would um, fill out that card. It helps us to uh, evaluate and improve our programs. And you can just leave the card on your chair. You're welcome to take the pen with you. Charlie will tell his story, and then when, when he is finished, um, we will have time for a few questions. So please join me in welcoming uh, Sheriff Charlie Hanger. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Well, it is a pleasure to be here. I don't like standing behind a podium, so I'm gonna wander around up here so I can uh, see everybody and hopefully everybody can hear me. It's always a pleasure to be here at the memorial and visit with my friends and uh, visit with groups that come in. And to tell you uh, what small part I had in the investigation and of course the arrest of McVeigh and the investigation of the, uh, the bombing at, as a whole. But on that uh, morning on April 19th, 1995, started off as many, many other day shifts that I had worked throughout my career. At that time I'd been a trooper about 18 and a half years. And this was a cool spring morning, went to work about seven o'clock, began my duties as a state trooper, and began patrolling the roads east of Perry in the eastern part of Noble County. At that point in my career, my, my detachment area, my area of responsibility was of about 30 miles of Interstate 35 and all of secondary roads in Noble County. I made a few traffic stops that morning on my way to the Cimarron Turnpike where I was going to go over there to meet with some troopers. I walked into the headquarters there a little before nine o'clock, was visiting with the people there and had been there only a short time when I began to, all of us began to hear a lot of radio traffic over the police radio there. Oklahoma City headquarters was sending just numerous units to downtown Oklahoma City. We knew that something was going on, we didn't know what. We turned on the television and saw almost instant coverage of what was taking place here in downtown Oklahoma City. We saw that the front of the Murrah building had been blown away. A third of the building was gone. The parking lot across the street, cars were on fire, smoke everywhere. It was total chaos. And looking at that damage and everything that was going on, you knew that many people must have been killed and injured. But never at that point did I think an act of terrorism. Never entered my mind. I was thinking a natural gas explosion, something of that nature that must have caused that terrible event. Within just a few minutes, I get a radio call from my headquarters to respond to Oklahoma City, report to the command post and assist as needed. Now what I'll be talking about throughout this is the importance of routine traffic enforcement, how our system of criminal justice system works, and how divine intervention had a big part in the arrest and things that happened after that arrest of Tim McVeigh. 
So as I start back across Highway 64 with red lights and siren on, responding to Oklahoma City, I get to Interstate 35 and I go south. And I haven't went a half a mile south when I believe the divine intervention starts. Because I get another radio call instructing me to disregard that assignment to stay in my area on routine patrol. So I crossed the center median and proceeded back north on Interstate 35 because I was aware of a possible motorist assist just a short distance north of uh, the North Perry exit. I pulled up there and I find two ladies in a minivan. They had broken down, their alternator was out. I called them a wrecker to get them some help. And one of them was the wife of an Oklahoma City firefighter. She was aware of what was going on in, in Oklahoma City and was concerned about what her husband's involvement might, that, might be and so they're wanting to get their car repaired so they can turn around and return to Oklahoma City. Now little did I know while I was sitting there waiting for that wrecker with these ladies, Tim McVeigh drove by my location in that old yellow Mercury. I wasn't looking for any particular car at that point, didn't see that car drive by. The wrecker arrived. I left and decided to go north on Interstate 35 and proceed to an area in northwest Noble County near the community of Billings, Oklahoma, because I had investigated an accident up there on Sunday evening. This was Wednesday. And it was investigated during the, dark, during the dark hours, and I wanted to look at that accident scene again to see if I'd missed any physical evidence, because I really felt like at some point during my shift, I would still be sent to Oklahoma City. I wanted to get that task done. So I'm traveling up the interstate at a rather high rate of speed, and I'm about a mile from where I'm going to exit off to get on State Highway 15, and I pass this old yellow Mercury that's in the right lane. I was in the left lane as I went past it. I noticed it didn't have a tag on the rear bumper. Now I had to slow down so I could get back behind it because I was traveling faster than it was. Fell in behind the vehicle, turned on my emergency lights and began what I thought was another routine traffic stop. At that point in my career, I had made thousands of routine traffic stops. This started like many others except that I, I took note the way this individual was stopping was different than the way most traffic violators stop. When he pulled off onto the shoulder, he didn't just stop on the shoulder, he pulled his car halfway into the grass and left the left wheels on the, on the shoulder and the right wheels in the grass. I could only see the occupant, one occupant in the car, the driver, and the way I was trained to make my traffic stops, I did that day, I got out, stood behind my open door because it offered me concealment and cover in the event that a, something violent would take place. I yelled for the driver to step out. His door opens and he turns around and he sits on the edge of the seat. He's looking to the west, and not back toward me. And I'm wondering what he's doing. And I again instruct him to driver step out of the car. And a few seconds later he did began walking toward me. I could see his hands are empty, no weapons. I felt it was safe to get out from behind my open door and we met between the two cars. Now I told him why I had stopped him. I said the reason I've stopped you is because you don't have a tag on your car. He immediately looked to the rear bumper where the tag should be, looked back at me and says, oh yes, I knew I didn't have a tag. I've just recently purchased this and I haven't had time to purchase a tag. So I'm thinking, if you knew you didn't have a, a tag, why did you look? Because officers are trained to read body language, nonverbal communications. He's being very polite. He's a clean-cut clean uh, looking young man. He's wearing dark slacks, a blue windbreaker type jacket, barely zipped up at the bottom. He's got a military style haircut. So I began questioning him and I said, well, do you have a bill of sale for the car? No, I don't. The, uh, the salesman is still filling it out. I'm thinking, you know, how long does it take to fill out a bill of sale? And uh, verbally said that to him, and he says, I don't have it. Do you have proof of insurance? No. So I'm beginning to think, even though this is a junky looking old car, that maybe it's a stolen car. And so I said, well, do you have a driver's license? Yes, I do. 
when he went to his right rear pocket to retrieve his billfold and produce that driver's license, I, it, it tightened that jacket up on the left side. And I saw a bulge under his arm, left arm that looked like a weapon. He handed me his dr a driver's license, which was a Michigan driver's license with an address in Decker, Michigan. I looked at the photograph, looked like the same individual I was talking to. I took that license and I stuck it in my gun belt. And I said, I want you to take both hands and I want you to un slowly unzip your jacket and I want you to slowly pull it back so I can look under it. He began to comply. He slowly unzipped the jacket and he's just starting to pull it back when he looks me in the eye and he says, I have a weapon. I reached up and I grabbed the bulge on the outside of his jacket. At the same time, I'm grabbing him, spinning him around, saying, get your hands up and turn around. I drew my weapon and stuck it to the back of his head. I then instructed him to walk to the trunk of his car. And about halfway there, he made a statement to me. And at the time, I thought he was trying to intimidate me. He said, my weapon is loaded. And I nudged him in the back of the head with my barrel of my pistol, and I said, so is mine. And we continued to walk. We got to the trunk of the car, spread him out on the trunk. And when I pulled his jacket back and saw how his weapon was holstered, it was in what I call a suicide holster, where the barrel is pointed up toward the armpit and the grip is down below. Then I began to understand maybe what he meant by his statement, my weapon is loaded. I think he was afraid I was going to accidentally discharge his weapon because I had such a death grip on the outside of his jacket holding that, that weapon. So I removed that weapon, threw it to the shoulder of the road. He said, I have a, a knife and a scabbard under my jacket. I removed that, threw it to the shoulder of the road. He said, I also have a magazine for the weapon under there. I removed that, threw it to the shoulder of the road, finished searching him, patting him down, handcuffed him, didn't find any other weapons, and I put him in the front seat of my patrol car and seat belted him in, handcuffed behind his back. I went up and retrieved the evidence that I'd thrown down on the shoulder and took it to the trunk of my car. While I was unloading the pistol, I took the magazine out of the pistol and it was fully loaded with 45 caliber round ball ammunition. This was a model 21 Glock semi-automatic pistol. But when I took the round out of the chamber that was ready to fire, it was a black talon round, which is a Teflon coated bullet designed to pull a, penetrate a bulletproof vest and do maximum damage to the human body. I took that unloaded pistol up to my unit and was going to call my headquarters to tell them what I was doing because they had no idea I'd made a traffic stop. They didn't know where I was at or what I was doing because the radio net was directed to the ongoing emergency in Oklahoma City and you could not talk on the radio unless you had emergency traffic yourself. So I used my cell phone. Now, not like these nice little cell phones we all carry today, trust me. It was one probably like you, that you young people have never seen, but maybe some of the older people in here have. It was a bag phone, about that long, looked like a little black bag, had antennas sticking out of it, and I dialed headquarters, they answered on the first ring, and uh, I was able to tell them what I was, where I was at, what I was doing, and I began running checks. I'm looking for the serial number on the weapon as I'm talking to the dispatcher on the phone, and I'm not readily finding the serial number. And just as I had located it, Tim McVeigh says the serial number is VM731. Now, I don't know that was the actual number he said, but I said, well, that's pretty close. You're only one digit off. I said, most people wouldn't know that. He said, I do. So I knew this guy was a, a firearms enthusiast because most people do not know the serial number of their weapons. Of course, most people don't carry their weapons on their person either. I run the weapon through NCIC, which is the National Crime Information Center in Washington, D.C., that all law enforcement officers access to check on uh, articles like uh, guns, uh, any, anything that might have a serial number. And I also ran Tim McVeigh's information through NCIC. The weapon was not reported stolen. Tim McVeigh was not reported to be wanted. I couldn't find a felony conviction on him that would prohibit him from possessing a firearm. But I did ask the dispatcher to send a teletype to Junction City, Kansas, where he uh, had told me he purchased his car at a Firestone dealership 
from a salesman by the name of Tom. So the dispatcher was proceeding to do that and uh, hung up talking to uh, Tim McVeigh. I read him his rights. He says he understood them, agreed to talk. Also asking for consent to search his car, which he granted, even though I didn't need that consent to search it at that point. I went up and retrieved the vehicle identification number from the left front windshield area of the car and came back and ran that number through NCIC to see if it was stolen. It was not, not reported. I tried to get a registration check through Oklahoma and Kansas to see if there was a tag assigned to that and if it was valid. I couldn't find one. And while I'm talking to the dispatcher there on the phone, I tell him that there's a sticker of some sort on the front windshield, that I'll see what that is and we'll run it through that state. Tim McVeigh spoke up, he said, that is an Arkansas sticker. At that time, they ran the VIN number through Arkansas, did come back with a, a registration to, a, a, to two people, in a, a couple in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, and the tag had expired. So I continued on up and began my search of the, the car itself. Started in the front seat area. I looked in there, there wasn't a lot of things in there. There was a piece of lined writing paper with some writing, there was a ball cap. And there was this legal sized envelope that was sealed up and about a quarter to a half inch thick. I began feeling of it to see what might be in it and it felt like it, maybe it was currency, it was money. I had no probable cause to open that so I didn't. As I looked into the back seat, I also looked into my patrol car and I could see that my prisoner was squirming around in the car while he was handcuffed behind his back and I thought he was trying to get out of the handcuffs. And so I proceeded back to, to the unit, opened the passenger's door, and I said, what are you doing? Are you trying to get out of the car, out of your handcuffs, or what's going on? And he says, no, they're tight. I'm just trying to adjust them. So I, I get him out, check the handcuffs. They weren't tight. I loosened them just a little bit, put him back in the car, seat belted him in, and went about my business of finishing the search, checking the trunk area, and so forth, and had found nothing of any significance. So I go back to my unit and I begin to explain to Tim McVeigh that uh, he has some choices. I can impound his car at his expense or I can leave it at the roadside at his risk. And I ask him which he would like to do. He chose to leave the car at the roadside and bear the risk of leaving it there. I said, do you have any valuables in that car that you'd like to take with you to jail? No, I don't. I said, what about that envelope? Because I really wanted to look in that envelope. I didn't have any probable cause. I knew if we took it to jail, we could inventory it in the, into his property. He said, no, leave it there. Just secure the car, lock it up, and leave everything in there. And so that's what I did. Got back in my unit. We turned around. We started south on Interstate 35 to the Noble County Jail. We're about 15 to 20 minutes out, out of uh, Perry. On the way to jail, he's trying to make small talk. He's asking me questions like, what kind of engine I've got in my car, or how fast will it run. I wasn't in a very talkative mood, and so I didn't have much conversation with him. He wanted to know how he could get his weapon back. He was very concerned about that. Also, at one point, I did ask him, you know, why would you carry a weapon on your person? Because if you'd have made one false move, you could have been shot. And he said, I felt like I had the right to carry that weapon for my protection. So I knew he had some strong feelings on weapons and that, those issues. I looked up in my rearview mirror as we're traveling down the road and I see a, a car coming up behind us at a pretty high rate of speed. And as it gets closer and starts around us on the left side of the, on the left lane, I could tell it's an unmarked police vehicle of some type with all the antennas. There's two, you know, uh, two, officers as in suits. I didn't know whether they were federal officers or who, and I felt like they were probably going to Oklahoma City. They wanted to acknowledge themselves to me, so I didn't stop them, I'm sure. They proceeded on. The radio in my unit, there was a lot of radio traffic about sending units to Oklahoma City and everything going on there at that time. Tim McVeigh never asked any questions about any of that, never said anything, and I thought, well, maybe he's just really scared, more scared than what he appears, and he's worried about his own plight. And also, I had noticed that the, in the dash of his vehicle, there was uh, no radio, so you know, if he was not going to hear any radio broadcast, 
about what, what was going on in Oklahoma. He had told me that he was on his way back from Arkansas where he was moving to, had taken a load of his belongings down there and was on his way back to pick up more of his belongings that was in his car that had broken down in Junction City, Kansas. We get to the Noble County Jail and pull in there. I secure the evidence that I had taken from him out of my trunk and take it and him into the courthouse and up to the, to the Noble County Jail on the fourth floor and began the booking process. The uh, jailer that morning was a lady, her name was Marcia. She had booked in many prisoners for me over, over the years and started what we thought was just another routine booking. Everything was going fine. He was uh, answering the questions and the booking process was going smooth, so I decided to sit down behind the booking desk at a computer and prepare the probable cause affidavit that the district attorney would need to file the charge, or charges. So I was doing that and had been working on that for a few minutes when I heard the Marsha ask uh, Tim McVeigh who he wanted to list as the next of kin on the booking sheet. And he didn't answer. She asked him again, he still didn't answer. So I thought he was getting ready to give her some trouble. So I stood up, walked to the end of the booking counter. I said, did you hear the question? He indicated he did. I said, answer it. He still did not answer the question. So Marsha began to explain to him you know, we're not going to call your next of kin to tell them you're in jail, but we need a number, a contact, in case something would happen to you while you're here, you get sick. She says, what about this address on your license, this Decker, Michigan address? Who lives there? And he says, well, that is a brother of a friend I was in the military with. Well, the friend he was in the military with was his co-conspirator, Terry Nichols, and the brother was James Nichols. James lived at that address that was listed on Tim's driver's license. So that's what was recorded on the booking sheet there at the Noble County Jail. The rest of the booking was completed without any incident. The sheriff uh, put the, uh, the prisoner in a cell. I went back downstairs to finish some more of my uh, paperwork, turn in the evidence to the sheriff, get a receipt. And while I'm there working on that project, I get another call from my headquarters. They uh, are asking me to respond to Interstate 35 to look for a brown Chevrolet pickup occupied by three Middle Eastern males who now are, we know are suspects. They suspected them of being involved in what we now knew was the bombing of the Murrah building. So I respond to that location. I look for this pickup, sit out there for a considerable amount of time. Nothing comes by my location matching that description. I'm released from that assignment. I go to lunch. I finish my paperwork before I finish my end of my shift, and I go home to be off for three days. Like I say, that was on a Wednesday. On Friday morning while I'm at my home, I get a call from uh, the dispatcher at my headquarters, and they're wanting to know if I ran a particular social security number through NCIC on Wednesday. And they give me the number. It starts with a low digit like one, two, three. And I say, well, I think that was the guy that I arrested on Wednesday because that number is not common to, to our area. Most Social Security numbers in Oklahoma start in the 400 range. I said, but I'll need to con call the jail and have them check the record booking sheet to see if that's the particular number. I called. It was the same number. I called them back, and I said, yes, that's the uh, individual I jailed Wednesday. It was his Social Security number. Is he still there, they asked. I said, I don't know. I didn't, didn't check. Divine intervention is getting ready to continue. I called back, and sure enough, uh, he was still there, and getting ready to go before the judge for his initial appearance. Now, normally, a prisoner would have seen the judge the next day, which would have been Thursday, but the judge was tied up with a divorce case and couldn't see any prisoners that morning, and so it was put off until Friday. This is a little after 10 when I had received this call and all this is taking place. And he should have already seen the judge by that time. But the judge's son had missed the bus to go to a, a band function in Stillwater, and so the judge had to take him and delayed court again. That, ladies and gentlemen, has to be divine intervention because Tim McVeigh was still there. I've instructed to call the, uh, the major at the command post in Oklahoma City and it was then when I found out that Tim McVeigh was a suspect in Oklahoma City bombing. 
They instructed me to contact the sheriff to put a hold on him for the FBI and that the FBI would be in touch shortly. I called the sheriff, a good friend of mine, also a former trooper, told him what it was, uh, relayed to him what was told to me, and I think he, at first he thought it was some kind of really bad joke because it had took me just a little while to convince him this is the truth and that you're holding this suspect in your jail. So he goes up to the court, stops the proceedings where the where Mr. McVeigh is getting ready to go before the judge, and the prisoner's taken back upstairs, locked up. But the judge at that time went ahead and assigned an attorney to Tim McVeigh to protect his rights. I was instructed to report to the Noble County Sheriff's Office and that the FBI would be in touch with me there. When I walked into the Sheriff's Office, and I drove my personal vehicle down there that morning, I didn't drive my unit drove my pickup down, walked into the sheriff's office and the sheriff was on the phone with the FBI. He had me on the phone and I was instructed uh, to meet them at the roadside where the car was left and that they would be flying out by way of helicopter and would contact me there. I got a hold of my partner, Trooper Keith Kuhn, who was working that morning and he came by the sheriff's office, picked me up and we responded to that location, arrived there and just shortly we saw this military helicopter circling looking for a landing zone. He landed on the east side of the interstate. I visit with the supervisory agent in charge, and he wanted me to look at the car to make sure it was appeared to be the same as I had left it. I went over and checked. It was still locked. All the windows were up. I peered through the windows to see that everything that I had seen that morning was still in the seat, the front seat. And so they decided, rather than to get a search warrant and execute it along the side of the road, conduct their search there, that they would tow the vehicle to a safer location and execute their search warrant at that location. So that's what they decided to do. I was instructed to go back to the courthouse, meet with an agent there so they could take my statement. We went back to the courthouse. As we turned the corner to, to drive into the courthouse, I thought another crime had occurred while we were gone. Crime scene tape was all around the building. They had the entrances blocked. But another crime had not occurred. The, the sheriff and the county commissioners had decided they needed to evacuate that building for the safety of the people that worked there because they didn't know if Tim McVeigh had friends that might try to blow up that building or try to break him out of jail. And so that, that building was totally secured. People were beginning to gather up there though because they had heard what was going on. While we were out there at the roadside before we left to come back to the courthouse though, there was a very alert FBI agent had seen a Jeep drive by with Arizona plates. And he had turned around somewhere and came back a second time and was snapping pictures. The agent waved him down, wanted to know what he was doing, who he was, and why he was doing that. He turned out to be an AP reporter out of Arizona. And no doubt he probably notified the media that something was going on there when he saw all these FBI and ATF agents, you know, looking at this car and, and, and around that helicopter. And so that's how the news media were tipped off, no doubt in my mind, that, that something was going on in Perry. Many people began to gather up in our little town square, probably two to 3,000 at one point, as well as all the media. After I'd given my statement to the FBI, I wanted to leave and uh, go home. I'd already made arrangements for my, my children to be taken to a safe location. I, I didn't want to drive my pickup because I couldn't. The media had put a ladder in the back, some media you know, had put a ladder in the back of my pickup so they could get up above the crowd that had gathered and they were using that to shoot their video in there. And I didn't want to be identified by them because I knew I couldn't talk to the media, had nothing to say to them didn't want to do anything that might harm the investigation that was ongoing. So I had one of my trooper friends take me home. We get to my house, the media has already found my home. They, many of them were, were there. Uh, come to find out that uh, at least some of them had tried to go to a local florist and send me flowers so they could fo follow the delivery truck there and the, the, the florist said, no, I know what you're doing, I'm, I'm not going to to allow you to do that. I don't need to sail that bad. But there was a young entre, entre, entrepreneur, a young man there that uh, lived in Perry, 
And everybody knows where their local trooper and law enforcement officers live in a small community. And he had drawn a map to my house and was selling it at $20 a pop. So he, he was making a lot of money off of it. That's how they found my home, because I lived out in a rural area out in the country. But uh, the media was very professional, very persistent. They wanted their story. I just couldn't tell them anything. So the troopers politely told them they would have to leave. When I went in and checked my answering machine, my phone actually would not quit ringing. It was continuously ringing. The answering machine had filled up and rewound, was taping over the first messages. So the media was really on the job quick and identifying who I was and getting my number and trying to contact me. Now, I hadn't been back in my unit since the day that I had made that arrest. This all occurred on Friday. On Saturday, I get a call that from uh, the major at the command post again, instructing me to come to the command post to meet with Governor Keating and go to a church to meet with some of the, the family, the survivors the, of uh, family members, survivors and family members of victims. When I got back in my unit that Saturday to go down to the Oklahoma City, I conducted what I always did, a little cursory search of the area of my unit. That unit was a, a car that had bucket seats. And so I'd look around in the back floorboard, in the front, anywhere where someone might have left something in there that could be used as a weapon against me, especially after I had had a prisoner in there. When I looked in the right rear floorboard, I found a crumpled up piece of paper. And as I un undid that paper, I saw that it was a business card to a military surplus store in Antigua, Wisconsin, which I later found was uh, actually a suburb of Chicago. On the back it says, we'll need more TNT at $5 a stick. We'll contact you after May 1. Now you remember Tim McVeigh squirming around in my car that morning when I arrested him. He wasn't squirming around in there because those handcuffs were tight. I believe that he was taking that business card out of his pocket or wherever he had it and stuck it down behind the seat he was sitting in and at some point it fell through to the floorboard behind him. I picked that up, put it in an envelope, treated it as evidence that it was. When I got to the command post, I turned it over to the FBI. They later analyzed that and found my, my fingerprints and Tim McVeigh's fingerprints on that car. Now, I don't know whether Tim McVeigh had other targets after the Oklahoma City bombing, but it would tend to be, believe that maybe he had just from what was written on that card because the bombing occurred on April the 19th here. He was wanting more explosives after the 1st of May. They used that evidence against him at trial. As you know, the trial was conducted in Denver, Colorado, moved so he could get a fair trial because it was felt like he could not get a fair trial in Oklahoma City, and probably he couldn't have. But two years later, he was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. Now, regardless of what, you, what your feelings are in the death penalty, I know many people feel that they do not support the death penalty, and that's fine. We live in America. We can, we can agree or disagree with anything we want. But one thing is for sure, Tim McVeigh will never harm another individual and he'll never influence anyone else to do the same. And I feel like if the death penalty was ever appropriate, it was appropriate in that incident, incident for the many lives he took and many he affected. His co-conspirator, Mr. Nichols, also was tried in Denver by a different jury at a different time, he was not given the death sentence. He was given life and is still serving life at federal, in the federal prison system. Mr. Nichols was brought back to Oklahoma to be tried for the 160 deaths of the civilians in Oklahoma. He was tried in McAllister. He escaped the death penalty again, but he will never get out to harm anyone. I would tell you that this story magnifies the fact that routine law enforcement, routine traffic enforcement works. I was out there performing the job that I had done for 18 and a half years and done every day. But on this particular time, it made a big difference. Could have been any officer anywhere stopped him McVeigh. It just happened to be me. 
our system of justice worked. A thorough investigation was conducted by many agencies. He was tried, convicted, he had provided with the best lawyers to defend him. His sentence was carried out. Our system of justice worked. Divine intervention did take, a place, take place that day and the days following his arrest, as I explained. And I think because of what had happened, we all are more vigilant in what we see around us. We're more aware of our surroundings because of what we went through here, what they went through in New York City, and other places that we read about and hear about each and every day. But there's not enough law enforcement officers anywhere to see and hear everything that we need to see and hear about. And so that's where you come in. You're out and about in your communities, in your neighborhoods, your schools. If you're in school and you hear something about a student saying something that is extreme, that he's going to harm someone, or has these strange viewpoints that you think he might carry out a harmful act, tell someone. Tell your mom and dad. Tell your teachers. Let someone know. And for the adults,